Good morning, everyone. Um, before we get going with today's session, I thought I'd pop on and just welcome everyone to the session. My name is Holly Hanfield, and I'm part of the Community Development and Engagement Team at RPAP. And our team found is found across the province, and I'm sure that some of you have worked with us in different contexts for sure. And we work in the, in the realm of attraction and retention of healthcare providers. I'm up in the northwest part of the province and live in, in Grand Prairie, and everyone else is in different spots across the province. As you know, engagement this past year with our communities has looked very different. And we've had to adjust a lot of what we do to, in order to navigate the restrictions and health guidelines that have been in place as a result of COVID-19. Today, we are thrilled to have Lisa Adegal from <clears throat> the Tamarack Institute to speak to us about reigniting our rural community engagement strategies. We recognize that several communities we work with are struggling a little bit and are unsure of where to go next. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please be sure to put them in the chat and we'll watch these um, and do our best to answer them. And then of course, there'll be time at the end for questions as well. And if by chance we don't get to all of them, we'll make sure that they do get addressed after the presentation is over. We actually have people joining us from all over, all over Alberta today, and we're curious to learn a little bit more about you. So if everyone can look at their screen and select the answer that best fits them, that would be very much appreciated. All right. Before we get going with the main presentation, I want to acknowledge that Alberta is the homeland of many Indigenous peoples. It is the ancestral land of many First Nations peoples and within the boundaries of colonial Alberta, we live on the land of the First Nations Treaty 6, Treaty 7 and Treaty 8 territories. We also recognize that this is the home of eight Métis settlements and the Métis nations of Alberta. Hello everybody, my name is Lisa Atagala uh, and I'd also uh, like to start by acknowledging and uh, sharing with gratitude the lands that I'm joining from. Uh, so I'm joining from Waterloo, Ontario, which is uh, the, the lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe and the neutral people. And um, one of my favorite, you know, as, as I think about the, the work in front of us in terms of reconciliation and what that means, um, one thing that helps to guide uh, my work uh, is uh, knowledge of the treaties that exist in this area. And in particular, there's one uh, called the Dish With One Spoon Treaty. And it's about how uh, we're all invited to share um, in the land uh, and be respectful of the land with the knowledge that we share uh, the same spoon uh, and that there's no knives at the table. And so I think, uh, especially as we think about how we engage with each other on these lands, um, that visual, uh, I am, I'm a really visual person. And so that visual of a dish with one spoon uh, really helps uh, for me to think about the work um, so as settlers, um, we believe that the recognition of the contributions and historic importance of Indigenous peoples must be clearly and overtly connected to our collective commitment to make this promise of truth and reconciliation real. So as, uh, as we greet each other today, I invite you to share in the chat um, any the territories that you're uh, joining from uh, as an acknowledgement of, of gratitude as well. So as I said, my name is Lisa Artigala. I am the director of the community engagement area of Tamarack's work. Um, for those who aren't uh, familiar with Tamarack uh, yet, we are a national charity uh, and we exist to make the work of community change easier and more effective uh, in communities. And so we work with change makers like yourself, anyone looking to better uh, community life uh, and support them in making uh, their work um, as easier and more effective as possible. So we believe that there's five skill sets that are really foundational to community change. And you'll see those listed there in that top wheel, uh, collective impact, community engagement, collaborative leadership, 
community innovation and evaluating impact. So these are the core skill sets that we um, help to build capacity in uh, for change makers across the country and internationally as well. And then we also work to convene uh, networks who are working to address issues uh, in their communities. And so the networks that we convene are in reducing poverty, deepening community, uh, building youth futures, and most recently in supporting uh, climate transitions. And so uh, we believe in place-based work, in, in change happening at the community le level, being um, real and tangible and a good uh, leverage point for change. Joining me today is my colleague Rute, and I'll let Rute introduce uh, herself and give us a little bit of a tech overview as well. Sure. Thanks, Lisa. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Rute Ojibo. I'm a community animator of digital engagement and marketing here at Tamarack. Um, just quickly before we get started, just to let you know about, about the technology, if you're having any issues, feel free to just send me a direct message in the chat box and I'll be help, happy to troubleshoot anything. If you're calling in by mobile, unfortunately, you wouldn't be able to see any um, screen sharing, but we'll be more than happy to send along any slides and any details afterwards. Over to you, Lisa. Thanks so much, Rute. And as we go through uh, today, invite you, as Holly said, to share any of any questions you have in the chat. Um, our plan for today uh, is I'll be um, I'll be sharing a presentation uh, for the the bulk of our time together, and really talking about two things. Uh, so one, as we think about reigniting our community engagement strategy strategies, uh, how can we get a sense of what's going on right now in terms of the landscape of community engagement, uh, how people are engaging communities to help us to think differently about what the role of community engagement might be at this time. And then also then to talk about how do we adapt the methods of engagement to suit uh, these times. And so I'll provide uh, ideas, stories, examples. Um, and so really do invite you to, uh, to add questions. Rute will be gathering those questions and be bringing them forward uh, in our last uh, 10 to 15 minutes of our time together. So that is our plan for today. Uh, thanks again for joining us. So my, um, as I mentioned, my, my role at Tamarack is to, uh, is, is the lead of the community engagement area. And so with that, I support uh, organizations, collaboratives, uh, municipalities, regions uh, in their community engagement strategies. And so that has allowed us to have this really um, a breadth uh, of, of lens in terms of looking at what's happening in community engagement and what questions are people asking. And so we're going to run through some of the trends that we're seeing. And so invite you to consider these trends as, um, as sparks, as ideas for what might this mean uh, for my work. And so uh, the first one is around the demand for more transparency. So what we're, what we're seeing here is that, and so this is like prior to COVID, prior to pandemic, uh, people in authority-based positions would often only share information uh, when they had answers, when they had this information to say, okay, here's the solution, here's the answer. And I think what this time has caused is the requirement to share even when there aren't answers. And so I think, um, you know, that coincides with a demand for more information. Um, but it, it's also coming at the same time that there's some overwhelm. There's so much information. How do we make sense of all the information out there? And so this is a really unique combination of things that are happening. And so part of the, the need, part of what communities is, are asking for is transparency. We don't want a simplified version of the truth. We want the real truth. We want complexity to be communicated because people live complex lives and, and have, you know, are struggling with so much. And so recognizing that and saying yes and to, uh, to the complexity that's happening is important. 
And so we know how important uh, transparency is for bidirectional trust. And so this is uh, something that I follow every year. It's called the Edelman Trust Barometer. And they, uh, they look, measure public levels of trust across different sectors, different professions. And what this tells us is that when we look at the difference between a mass population and an informed public, so an informed public being those who are seeking out information and consuming information, people who are considered informed are more trusting in general across the board. Uh, their trust levels do fluctuate, but there's a, there's a significant increase in levels of trust for, uh, with people who feel informed. And so our question at this time, as you think about your role in community in engagement, is what might this demand for more transparency offer to you in your role? Is your role to be an information broker? Is it to be somebody who has answers and somebody who's seeking to simplify information and make it easy for people to understand? Uh, is it to be uh, the group who is listening, listening for the questions that are people that people are asking, and then seeking out those uh, those answers? What is your role as you think about how do I respond to this demand for more information despite information overload? So trend number two uh, is around digital engagement. So. Digital engagement has been something that we have seen as being um, an, an afterthought or on the side or something to complement face-to-face engagement. Uh, and with the pandemic uh, and with face-to-face uh, -face not always being an option anymore, we've seen this huge pivot to digital. Digital engagement is the expectation. And as we've been looking across uh, our communities, uh, we've noticed that people who already had digital channels in place had a much easier time doing this pivot. They didn't have to start from scratch. They didn't have to establish relationships in these digital channels. And so uh, regardless of where you're starting in terms of your, your digital offering, I think what this time has, uh, has taught us is that we actually can connect meaningfully digitally. Uh, I think it was always considered subpar. And so I'm not sure about you, but I, I have been surprised that I can uh, do meaningful work in a digital format. Whereas we always used to say, oh, we, we, we could only have that conversation in person. Um, and so uh, my, my question for you at this time is, um, when can digital engagement be meaningful? Um, what is possible? what has, what is now possible that wasn't before. And so an example um, that I was hearing from um, one of the rural Ontario communities we work with, it was around providing mental health supports. And so something that is now possible that wasn't before is before um, some of the mental health um, education programming that was only available uh, in Toronto. Uh, now those organizations have made their supports available digitally, which means that the rural communities are able to access these uh, education supports that weren't available before. And so we're seeing with the, the pivot to digital, uh, we're seeing more being available that wasn't before. And so uh, as we think about um, instead of digital engagement being this add-on or afterthought, how can it be a core piece of how we're engaging the community? Trend number three is around ownership. And I think this comes from um, a sense of lack of control um, when, when we feel like there, are, there is so much that, that we don't have control over, that we can't make decisions on, that people are telling us, you know, what needs to happen. Um, we've seen a, um, a desire for more ownership. So 
For me, I think it's really important for everybody to understand the difference between buy-in and ownership, uh, because I think we tend to use these words interchangeably, but within the, the field of community engagement, I think the difference is really important. And so buy-in is when somebody else develops an idea or makes a decision, and then they communicate that and want a community to agree that it's a great idea. So, uh, you know, here's what's happening. We have this great new program. We have a great new support or service. Uh, here's how you can use it. And, and we're seeking community agreement, validation, buy-in for that idea. Ownership, on the other hand, is when stakeholders, community members develop an idea. Uh, they are part of making decisions or designing an action plan. They're contributing to that work. Uh, and so ownership, can only be achieved, that feeling of ownership, that sense of ownership can only be uh, achieved if community members are part of the process. And so as we think about what that means for community engagement, and we look at the community engagement continuum, so this is kind of the base theory for community engagement, it's, it's an adaptation of the IAP2 public participation spectrum. So from left to right, it's deepening levels of community engagement. So we go from informing this one way communication and organization out to a community. The next level is consult. This is where we're asking questions and, and seeking feedback uh, from community members. The next level is involve. This is when we're working directly with stakeholders earlier on in the process. So, so they're problem solving with us. We're, we're discussing some issues or some problems and we're working together to understand what some solutions might be and how we can achieve that. Collaborate is when you're partnering. So multiple organizations or multiple sectors, multiple bodies, uh, including community groups working together on something. So they're, um, they're working together from the get-go. They're co-defining what the shared vision might be, what the work is. And then empower is when um, where community members are in that decision-making role uh, or leadership role. And so as we think about each of our pieces of community engagement, if we're seeking ownership, it can only be achieved when we're at the, the deeper levels of the continuum. It's not possible to, uh, to consult, to, you know, to say, hey, here are some options, what do you think? And then be seeking this sense of ownership. And so uh, it's not to say that we always need ownership, but if you're doing work where you think that uh, that community ownership, that sense of control, that sense of power, that sense of decision making is important, then we need to engage differently. And so I think what can be challenging is that so often we're experiencing consultation fatigue. You know, people are asked about so much right now. Things are constantly changing. Uh, but it's important, I guess one, one thing that I am seeking out right now is actually engaging less, but engaging more deeply. So instead of trying to engage an entire community, how can I engage the, the um, fewer stakeholders who really care about this in a deeper way? And maybe that is a path to engagement at this time as we're adapting and reigniting our strategies. As we look to deepen engagement and move further down in this spectrum, move to these more ownership levels, um, there's really, um, I guess, critical reasons to do that. You know, it's not purely for a sense of community ownership. It's because community decision making offers things back to us. And one of those things is sustainability uh, for decisions. I love this, um, this graphic. It comes from Faust uh, Consulting based in Germany, um, but they're looking at different decision-making structures. So consensus-based decisions are on uh, the top left there. And uh, on the bottom right is a single person making a decision. So we've seen through the past year, there are situations where we want a single person or an authority making a decision and tell, you know, this is what's happening. Let's be clear and let's be um, uh, 
uh, let's bring the authority to that decision. And there's reasons why we want to do that. Emergency situations, we want to be making fast decisions and clear decisions. Uh, but there's other situations where we want different sorts of decision making. Um, you know, we could have con consultative decision making. We could have, you know, a majority type decision making. We could have a consent type decision making. Um, but when we're looking more in this top left realm, this is when more community is engaged and we care about getting to a solution that, um, that a lot of people agree with. And yes, this takes longer but those decisions will be sustainable, uh, more sustainable than a single person making a decision. And so this is another area when we're thinking about um, sense of ownership, sense of control. What are the areas um, that, that you could enable community having a sense of control rather than an, another, yet another decision being made um, that, that community are needing to react to or purely buy into? Number four is this uh, sense of increased polarization. Um, I'm not sure, I, I'm curious about what polarization might look like in your communities. Uh, feel free to add something uh, to the chat. Uh, one, one example that I often think about, uh, it's, a, it's a rural community uh, in Alberta that we were doing some work with. They had a nickname for a group of people called the cave people. Uh, which is citizens against virtually everything. Uh, and I, I love that. You know, I think about um, community members who have been there forever and newer community members and what some of the, the um, tensions between different community members might be. Um, we're seeing uh, globally a sense of increased polarization. Um, some of this is um, some of the contributing factors uh, to this are um, these echo chambers on social media where we only hear opinions of people who are similar to us. We're not hearing from the other side as much. Um, and I think what I guess where community engagement fits into this is that community engage engagement can be a vehicle to offer healthy spaces for uh, dialogue and debate. Um, it's not every single situation that we can uh, take the time to facilitate those conversations, but when an issue is important enough, uh, it's, it's, it's so critical that we are having healthy uh, dialogue, uh, that we're seeking out understanding each other's perspectives to find out something that would work for everybody. Um, there's lots of tools within the community engagement toolkit to do this. Uh, there are tools like co-design. Uh, so co-design is a process for working with a diverse and representative group of community members to figure something out. And so the process of co-design is a series of divergent and convergent phases where first we share perspectives, learn from each other, learn about the different things that people care about. And then based on that, we say, what's true? What's something that we all care about? What's our shared vision? Only then, once we've aligned to that shared vision, do we start to build ideas and brainstorm and then decide on, based on that, what, what should work, what might work moving forward. When we don't go through a process like this, sometimes we jump straight to phase three. We generate some ideas or some options, and then we might debate those options or put it to a vote. And then in those scenarios, often we end up with, um, a, you know, a, a majority of people, and it might just be a slight majority that wants, you know, option three, and then everybody else is unhappy. Uh, and so what some of these engagement techniques allow for is this deliberation amongst community members, you know, discussing, you know, what might work, um, weighing the merits, um, understanding what that might um what that might mean for different groups. Um, it, it's a considered approach uh, and it's a discussion-based approach where we're seeking to learn. Other techniques might be, um, there's other deliberative dialogue techniques, citizens juries, for example, um, participatory processes. So participatory budgeting is another one where people are um, choosing and making decisions uh, about how they think a decision should be made. 
And so I think, you know, regardless of technique, it's about doing the work out in the open rather than, um, you know, asking a question, listening and analyzing results and then announcing a solution where some people are happy and some people are unhappy. It's about involving the community in those decisions. And so the questions here are around, you know, where could we empower community members to be in this decision-making role, to give, to empower them more, to build their capacity to lead um, and, uh, and make decisions. Number five is an increased need for relationship building. Uh, now, this is something that, you know, as I think about the journey of community engagement uh, over the years, um, way back uh, when community engagement was popularized as a field, it was in order to make decisions. That was some of the key reasons why we were doing it. And it was based in consultation. Uh, and then it's often the health sector who has broadened the work of community engagement uh, to these other uh, two areas on the triangle. So I'm engaging with the community in order to strengthen relationships, to understand their needs and learn from community. And I'm engaging in order to build capacity. So build knowledge, build skills, build leaders. And so all of these three areas of this engagement triangle, which comes from Kapir Consulting, uh, are really important. Um, and so as we think about, you know, when I'm working with groups and coaching groups uh, over the past year, the number of times there's been a challenge brought forward and then we're brainstorming solutions together, the, the answer, the work that needs to be done is so often in this relationship building. You know, I want to I want to engage and learn from a community group that I don't yet have a relationship uh, with or I, you know, they're not showing up and I don't know why. Um, it's because we haven't yet done the work to understand and build those relationships. And so when I think about the opportunities uh, for reigniting engagement um, right now, a lot of it, it comes down to um needing to do the work to build relationships. This is something that rural communities excel at. Um, and so I think it's a strength. I really, really think it's a strength uh, that we need to lead with at this time. Uh, there's this really great guide um, from the Vitalist Health Foundation uh, based in the, in the States. And Rute, are you able to share the link uh, to that pre-engagement uh, guide from the Vitalist uh, Foundation in the chat? Uh, this is a, a guide that I reread uh, every six months as a way to, um, to challenge myself. And so when we think about pre-engagement, it's what, what relational things are needed before we start engaging. And so um, pre-engagement is necessary to build trust before, you know, making assumptions about how to engage a community. And some of the questions that we want to ask is around what's the history of the community? What networks and structures already exist? Um, who are those community champions and connectors? Who can connect us in? Um, you know, so that who, who are the relationship brokers who can uh, introduce us to community members? Uh, how has the community been engaged in the past and what strategies uh, for engagement would actually work for community members? It helps us to not make assumptions uh, as we go in. And so thinking about pre-engagement is so important at this time as well. Through the past year, we've also seen a re-emergence of one-on-one -on -one engagement. And so as we as we got better at community engagement over the last 20, 30 years uh, and more tools and more techniques have been available, uh, we've kind of lost a little bit the art or, um, you know, haven't necessarily focused on the importance of one-on-one -on -one engagement. And over the past year, this is something that has really shone through. Uh, you know, we could send out a survey and then, uh, you know, be, potentially be disappointed with the uptake or the response rate, uh, and then might follow up individually uh, with people uh, to figure out what's going on. Um, we've, we've learned that taking the time to do one-on-one -on -one engagement, picking up the phone, calling somebody, sending a personalized email, um, going for a walk with somebody if we want to learn about what's going on in their lives uh, is, is resulting in such better um, 
engagement, whatever the results that we're seeking, rather than these kind of mass communication methods at this time. And so I'll give you some examples in just a minute about how we're seeing this one-on-one -on -one show up, um, but it's, it's exciting. It's really exciting to kind of get back to the basics in terms of how we connect with people. And I think um, it's, it's these times when we can't connect, uh, we can't gather, but we can still connect. And I think it's, it's recognizing that connection is something that people are seeking. And so how can our work facilitate connection um, that meaningful connection rather than being kind of transactional in nature. And the last one here is number six. And so, um, you know, over the past year, um, we talk about, you know, the, the multiple pandemics that are happening and um, thinking about uh, diversity, equity and inclusion, thinking about whose voices are left out of conversations, um, think, I think the work of community engagement or an opportunity as we're thinking about reigniting community engagement right now is how can your role um, be somebody be a vehicle for lifting up voices who, uh, who need to be lifted up? Uh, how can community engagement be a platform for equitable change? And I think something that we need to remember throughout, of the, throughout this work, um, I love these terms, content expert. These are the people uh, who uh, are the, the people with the formal education, the credentials, uh, they have uh, formal expertise and they have a lot to bring to a, all of the work that you're doing. Uh, and then we also have context experts. And these are the people, uh, community members with lived experience. They're the people who experientially know uh, about what's going on in their community. They know about, uh, you know, the mental health uh, uh, issues they're facing. Uh, they see what their children are dealing with. Uh, they understand and are frustrated by transportation issues, whatever it is. They're the people, they, they have so much expertise to bring it. And what I love about these titles is that we're naming both as expertise and so so the the work right now is you know how can we invite uh, people to play a role a, a more increased role in this whose stories need to be told whose voices can we lift up in this work so hopefully looking and thinking through those trends, thinking about what's happening right now, what's the opportunity, what are communities experiencing and what does that mean for community engagement can help spark some ideas um, for you in your work. As I think about these trends um, and I think about what's possible, that's kind of the why, like why we need to engage at this time, um, what's possible in terms of engaging. But then there's also this other a kind of very real piece around like, how do we engage? Um, what, what are the engagement methods that are working at this time where we're experiencing um, so many barriers? And so how can we think differently? How can we adapt our engagement strategies at this time? Uh, so this is the second uh, piece that I, I'd love to uh, talk through um, with you today. So when, um, you know, a year ago now, um, but it's been, you know, present with every wave of this pandemic that we've been experiencing is how can we actually engage? What methods do we have at our disposal? And so what I did is I took that engagement continuum and I listed our, you know, go-to engagement methods or, you know, what are our options for engagement at each of these Getting a note about losing audio. Are others, can you pop in the chat if you can hear me okay? I'm hearing you okay. Um, are others? Yep. Yeah, All right. Like okay. Thank you. Thanks for that check in. Uh, I'll make sure I'm loud enough as well. So uh, as we think, what I did is I listed these engagement uh, methods uh, and then I crossed out. Uh, absolute things that just aren't possible right now. And obviously it, it changes depending on area and on restrictions, but you know, what are the engagement uh, methods that aren't possible? I crossed them out. And the ones that have had to have a significant pivot, I changed to blue. So, you know, we used to do this in person and now it needs to be virtual. So it's still possible, but we need to change how it happens. 
And what this offered me just as a thought exercise is I was feeling this sense of, oh, we can't do anything. You know, all of our ways of engaging aren't possible anymore. And when I looked at this, um, it offered me hope. It offered me possibility. It made me think, oh, okay, like, sure, we can't do the public meeting, but, you know, what if we do these other things instead? What if we, you know, live stream the presentation and then have, have really great Q&A? What if we instead... Um, like one of the things that I've been so inspired by is the reemergence of the phone tree. This is another example of connection at this time. Uh, and so by looking at this, it, it offered me the ability to get creative. Uh, it's easy to default to your regular ways of engaging. And so by looking at something like this, I can say, okay, this it's not this, but what if it's this? And brainstorm, think through uh, different methods of engaging and just challenge ourselves to try something new. Um, people, I think that's another thing at this stage in pandemic is we do want to experience new. We want to be creative. We want to be different. We want to, uh, you know, catch people, uh, do something out of the normal. Uh, People are, are ready and hopeful uh, when they when we we're doing something differently. I think despite seeing this page, and yes, uh, you get a copy of all of these slides and this continuum uh, in particular. Um, you know, we can look at this and feel hope, but I, I, I also want to recognize that um, this past year has been really hard on people. And despite there being communication methods available to us, there are a lot of challenges and barriers that people are facing. And we need to be really cognizant of that. We need to recognize what are the barriers that people are facing. And so this is a list um, and this guide comes from Kapia um, and I'll include a link to this as well. Um, it's about inclusive community engagement in a time of physical distancing. And we need to recognize what are some of the barriers that people are facing because when we're designing engagement, um, we need to really be responsive to that. And so, you know, do people have access uh, to uh, the internet? and good enough connectivity um, is how do we respond to uh, geographic isolation? How do we respond to um, limited digital literacy if that's something people are facing? Uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm gonna put up a poll now actually, uh, a, and I'm curious, which of these um, barriers are you noticing most in your work, which of these personal barriers are you noticing in the communities you're seeking to engage? You can select as many as are relevant, um, but yeah, which of these barriers are, are causing you to, to shift uh, how you're engaging? Give it another 15 seconds. All right, three, two, and one. So this is really interesting. Um, limited digital literacy is something that's coming up a lot, as, especially as we think uh, both about um, different age groups um, as well as uh, different cultural backgrounds. And what's interesting is that all of these is something that you've experienced in your work. Wow. So I think, you know, as we think about what next, right? Uh, what do we do based on this? And so when we look at 
what we need to do is we need to pick engagement methods that are responsive to these barriers. And so I'll, I'll give you an example just in a minute. But before we do that, um, our engagement toolkit at this time is something that I, every time I'm thinking of how will I engage, I think to these four things. So uh, self-directed is uh, anything, imagine just as an example, an online survey. So people walking through something at their own time, uh, at their own speed. So that is self-directed. And this area in particular is unchanged. We can do all the self-directed tools that we always did. Um, we can do them right now. Small group is, you know, less than 15, 20 people. Uh, this is an area where we can still do it, but most of those pivots have been uh, going online, uh, you know, as Zoom meeting, uh, as an example. One-to-one. Uh, -one. So this is the area that we're seeing that resurgence. And then large group is the area where we're crossing most of these out. And we're thinking about, you know, combining some of these other um, options together instead. And so when we think about these barriers, when we think about what people are experiencing, we need to pick uh, methods of engagement that respond to that. Uh, so for example, if people have limited access to the internet, uh, we, we don't want to invite them to a large group online meeting. Uh, the connectivity won't be good enough. Even small group, um, people can't show up in an equitable way if they can't be on video when everybody else is, for example. And so we need to think about, you know, what is self-directed or one-to-one -one, uh, when we're wanting to engage people who have limited access to the internet. Um, how can we um, put things out that are asynchronous so people can respond on their own time? That's what an ex another example of self-directed. And so in the resources that you'll get, um, I really invite you to read this guide. It's, it's really wonderful. So take your own, the barriers that you're facing and think through based on these barriers, what are um, the appropriate methods of engaging accordingly? When we think in particular about the self-directed bucket, um, so, you know, the online survey is the example that I provided. We can think about self-directed tools um, in this way, which I think is really helpful. So we can think about self-directed tools, which ones are controlled. This means that an individual is sitting by themselves submitting their responses or answers, and it's going to the organization to analyze and share back. Um, so there's no interaction between community members. Mixed environments, on the other hand, are ones where um, I might share my story or share my question and others are able to see it. When we think about relational engagement and when we think about transparency, you know, what are other what are other people asking? Um, you know, what questions do others have? Am I alone in, in, you know, the experiences I have as a community member? Mixed environment tools really help us to, um, to facil facilitate more connection than controlled environment tools. And then open environment tools are ones where community members can engage with each other. And so a forum, a discussion board, um, you know, a commenting thread on social media, um, mapping tools or ideation tools. All of these would be open environments where people can, you know, respond or upvote or downvote other people's ideas, that sort of thing. And so as you're thinking about, you know, how can I reignite my engagement? Um, think about moving um, to the left on this, uh, on this spectrum. Move from surveys to how could I make this more interactive? How can I make this uh, allow for deeper connection between people? That's another way to switch things up when we think about the, uh, the self-directed uh, engagement tools. So the last thing I, I wanna do is just provide um, a few uh, quick examples, um, but some observations uh, about these um, as a result. So on the left, I have kind of what we would do on, a, on the regular and then what we've done, you know, during COVID. And the first thing you can notice is that the, the things on the right, there's more of them. So how we're adapting engagement right now is to have um, multiple approaches. It's not just one event 
one thing. We're needing to engage different people in different ways because of their, the barriers that they may be facing or what works for them uh, so that we can be as supportive as possible. So we're piecing together lots of engagement and that's the shift. Uh, it's a big shift in our work, but by doing it, we're getting to more of that one-on-one -on -one and connection focus. Um, so I'll just give you two uh, quick examples. So this data walk is something that um, we love data walks. Data walk is basically presenting a piece of inf uh, data and then inviting community members to reflect on that and respond to that and think about what this means for uh, your work. And so here's an example, um, you know, here's a piece of data. What are your initial reactions and how might this affect sustainability and viability? You know, and then they would spend 10 minutes there and then they would go to the next piece of data. You know, when we look at poverty rates, how are we reacting to that? Um, you know, how might our community support young people? So this is something that we used to do in person. We would invite a large group of people in together and people would walk around a room visiting these different stations. We can pivot this so that it's virtual. And this is a tool uh, called Mural that we've been using a lot. It's just a big old, uh, like a whiteboard uh, that's digital. Um, and it, it's been great. So really, if you're looking for digital collaboration tools, uh, Mural, uh, M-U-R-A-L, is a great one. Uh, but when we, so that's a quick pivot. But when we think about, um, the, the various components that we're adding together. What we did was invited key stakeholder groups to make their way through. So this is a small group session where people are making their way through these stations. But then we also put it out there for people to um, who want to work through it on their own. So people who didn't have connectivity or couldn't come at that set time, they can make their way through these questions and add their thoughts on their own time. Um, we also then opened it up. So before we had restrictions on how many people could be part of this, now we have a classroom who's going through these questions. Uh, we have a um, Rotary Club who's going through uh, these, these um, stations uh, and the BIA. And so they're all saying, okay, how does poverty affect our region? What are we going to do about it? And so what this has enabled, because we've made it virtual, it's enabled more people to participate, um, but then we're also allowing people to do it both at a set time and on their own time. So that's that's an example of a pivot. Uh, another one. Uh, so across 13 communities uh, in Canada, 80% um, of them rural, uh, we did this community visioning uh, in our Building Youth Futures uh, work. This used to be something that we would, it would be a whole day event. We would bring people together to do this community visioning. The pivot um, is instead we uh, recruited a representative and diverse community group uh, to, uh, to be the spokespeople for the community. So you, it's slower to begin with because we're making sure that this group, this small group, these 15 people are nominated by community members to speak and represent their interests and uh, include at least 25% youth um, and are across multiple sectors. With this one group, we had uh, two to three visioning sessions. Uh, we used Mural again, and people were, walked through, what's my vision for this community? Uh, they first reflected on the data about the community, then they, they went through what's the vision for the community. And in their work, they then, so they did this visioning, they made headlines based on what they wanted to see uh, from the community, we made observations about that. We talked about what uh, they reflected on an aspirational vision and provided feedback on it. Uh, all this work led us to a plan on a page. So articulating a five-year strategy in a single plan. So our vision is to be a place where every youth is empowered to become who they wanna be. Here's why that's important. Here's who's working together. Here's um, our critical path forward. Uh, once we had this plan on a page as a communications tool, uh, we then said to each person, so the 15 people who are part of this work, 
So they have ownership of the work because they created the plan together. We said, can each of you have five one-on-one -on -one conversations? So if 15 people are each having five conversations, we're meeting our 100 person, you know, we want this to be community wide. So each of those people are having five uh, conversations. In the process of that conversation, their ownership level is going deeper. They're taking it on themselves to communicate uh, that uh, to others and getting the, the community members feedback. It's also relational that they're reaching out to somebody specifically and saying, hey, I wanted to talk to you about this plan because I know you bring really rich experiences in this area. Um, so we each of the 15 people had five one-on-one -on -one one -on -one conversations. And then they came back in a third session to share the feedback that they received from a larger population and discuss how it might need to be tweaked or changed. And so when you think about that pivot, um, yes, it, it took a little bit longer than a single one day session, but I would argue that, you know, post pandemic, I might actually do it the same way. I think it offered so much in terms of relationship, uh, in terms of connection and in terms of ownership compared to people showing up for, for one day only. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I share that story as encouragement um, and just get creative in terms of how you're thinking through your engagement right now. Um, as the, the take homes from this, the, the questions that I'm asking teams as we're thinking about how to engage are, you know, is now the right time to engage? We don't want to stop engagement just because it's hard, but we don't want to engage about things that community doesn't care about right now. And so is now the right time to engage? If so, refocus on why you're engaging. You know, if you're engaging in order to learn, let's make sure that we are, you know, being relational in that. We're showing up so that we're listening well, um, that we're not sending out another survey. Um, don't just cre recreate your original plans. So in that last example of a pivot, we didn't just have an all day virtual event. You know, we had to recreate them so that, uh, so that it would be meaningful. So uh, like keeping our goals the same, um, but saying, how is that possible right now? And then provide the supports needed for people to participate fully. So we do need to consider who can't attend the, the, that session at that time and provide um, real ways for them to contribute meaningfully. So I wanted to uh, see if, uh, Rute, if there were any questions that came through that we want to respond to uh, at this time. And I saw a lot of comments about seeing that plan uh, on a page. Um, and yes, I will, we would, sh we'll share uh, the materials out uh, after this. Yes. So we've gotten quite a few comments. Um, and I think the most recent question here is from <clears throat> Anita. Um, and she's wondering, as we move forward, I can see a combination of in-person with an op option for people to join in virtually. Will those not physically present possibly become more disengaged and feel less connected to the larger groups? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I, I think it's, it's about asking, how can this process be meaningful for everybody? And so meaningful can look like different things. And so uh, for somebody not participating in the live event, they won't get certain things, but what, what can be done instead? How can it be meaningful to people who are participating in all the ways that you're offering? Um, and so I don't have you know, a, a pat answer of, here's what you should do for the people who are joining uh, you know, remotely, um, but like, please don't just have the people joining remotely, just observe the people who are interacting, uh, you know, have a separate time for people who are, who are all um, meeting virtually so that they can discuss things together. Um, you don't want it to be that subpar experience for a certain group. And so I would challenge myself to say, okay, what would make this meaningful for that group? How could they facilitate their own conversation in their community and then bring that back to 
you know, a person who is facilitating another conversation in another community? Like, how can we think differently about these hybrid options? Thanks, Lisa. And a little bit tied to that was something I was thinking through as you talked about <clears throat> ownership. And I thought about the, the idea of trust and how community doesn't necessarily always trust organizations or governments or whoever is getting involved with them. So how, especially now with the pandemic, how would you try to even start that process when communities don't even trust you to get involved or to even want to own any services or programs that you're thinking about creating? Trust. <laughs> Trust is something that takes so long to build and is so easily destroyed. And each of us show up with a different trust level with communities. Um, so, you know, whether or not, you know, you might be new to your role, but your organization has a reputation. Um, and so we need to be aware of all the baggage that we're bringing, you know, in terms of who we're representing and what we're showing up as. Um, I did a webinar specifically on this uh, topic on, um, it was called Bridging the Gap uh, and about uh, trust in online engagement and how to repair relationships. Uh, and so we'll send a link to that webinar in case you're interested. Um, one strategy that I always like to think through in terms of trust is who can be my relationship broker? So who is trusted? Uh, you know, who do I know that the community trusts and can they provide a warm, uh, warm connection versus a cold call? Um, can they help to say, hey, I know Lisa uh, wants to speak to, the, to your group about this thing, um, but I know, uh, you know, naming the things that have happened in the past. Um, you know, I, tr I, you know, the, the relationship broker saying, I trust that Lisa and that organization is wanting to ask these questions for good reasons. And so, um, you know, I'm wondering if I can make an introduction. And so like, who is the person who is trusted by a community uh, who I can get to know that I can prove myself that I can slowly build some of that relationship that's needed. And when you finally start start that kind of dialogue, there might be people, for example, let's say I don't want to offend a group, but then they have this like already strongly held views. Like how do we then challenge those things to actually have a conversation when um, not, I don't necessarily want people to think I'm trying to change their views, but I also want you to hear my side of it. So how do you kind of grapple with that in engagement? Yeah, yeah, it's a really great question. Uh, I, I always think that, you know, like the, the rules of listening are the, the most important thing here. So how do you show up genuinely wanting to learn about what this group cares about versus coming in with your own agenda? Uh, I think where we find connection is finding what is it that everybody cares about? Um, there's this really great tool um, called Codefining the Dilemma that we'll also link to. Um, but what it does is enable us to find, you know, what, what's the framing question that allows everybody to, to feel um, like they want to show up to a conversation. <laughs> so, for example, um, uh, this, this is um, not, not a real example, but hopefully it, it offers enough connection so uh people saying let's build the bike lanes other people saying no let's not build the bike lanes that's a waste of money other people saying you know are commuters and they don't want uh they want efficiency in driving um so instead of saying you know should we build the bike lanes or not we say how can we ensure that everybody can get around easily and safely What's the, what's the thing that invites everybody's perspective to exist so that we can have a good conversation about it? And so if I'm, if I'm walking into a situation where there's people with a very different opinion than another group, um, I want to show up and I want to seek to listen about what they care about. And then if we find the gem of, okay, safety is something that everybody cares about, then safety can be our bridge. Safety can be, a, okay, you care about safety, you care about safety, you care about safety. How can we ensure uh, that let's have a conversation about safety, <laughs> you know? And so it's reframing the thing, like what does everybody feel like that they care about and is part of their shared vision for the future? 
I want to, I know we're at time. So I want to thank you all for being here and listening and really um, like, thank you for your questions. And we will be sure to share these resources out to you. Uh, Holly, I know you have. Yeah. An I do have here as one well. last thing. So I just want to thank Lisa for giving us some great ideas and tools to help us reignite and refresh our rural community engagement. I know that I have communities in my area that really, um, they're struggling a little bit right now in this new reality if you can call it that so it's nice to have a few extra tools um, in our toolbox so i also wanted to let people on the line know that we do have another session coming up in may so our next information session is actually may 19th at, and it's at nine o'clock in the morning which is a little unusual for us but um, we're working with what we can and it'll feature the president and ceo of alberta health services dr verna Yu. Dr. Yu and her team will be sharing a 10-year vision and some key health priorities that they have for AHS in the years to come. I do hope that you will all join us for that and I look forward to seeing you there. And I'm, I'm asking, um, I have somebody putting the link in the, the direct registration link into the chat box for everybody to register. And then there's a poster that's also available, which is on the screen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wishing you a wonderful rest of your day.